you've got your Bibles, we'll be in uh, John chapter 3 this morning. John chapter 3. Look at verses 22 through, t- through 30, excuse me. And we're uh, doing a series on Sunday mornings through the book of John called One Way. John chapter 3, looking at verses 22 through 30. Give you a moment to find your place there in John chapter 3, verse number 22. So in reading here, it starts out in verse 22. After these things came Jesus and His disciples into the land of Judea. And there He tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Siloam, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying They came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness, bear me witness, excuse me, that I said I am not the Christ, but I am, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore, this my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Title of the message this morning is The Place of Praise. The Place of Praise. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we will. Uh, look in this passage and see what it is to have a place of praise. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for this day. God, I pray that You would take Your Word and take this hour and use it for Your glory and Your honor. I pray You'd help me to say what You want said. Keep me from saying anything You don't want said. And I pray that if there's anyone in this in this gathering this morning that uh, doesn't know for sure that they're saved, that this can be a, a time and a place where that gets nailed down. Uh, we give You all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There was a story that was told of a famous violinist who was about to perform in a a concert hall. And it was a very special concert hall in a very special place. He stood and the house was packed all the way wall to wall for people wanting to hear this violinist play. And he uh, starts off and plays this amazing performance so much so that every single person it looks like in the room stands up and get applauds him for his performance and and shouts encore encore he does it again uh does an encore performance and then he has a thunderous applause and and you would think if you were there that that this time every single person would have stood and, and uh, clapped and they called for another encore and he did it again and he did it two more times <coughs> excuse me and then finally, after that fourth time, he uh, nodded his head and he exited the stage to uh, several cheers that could be heard even after he was off the stage. Reporters went to his uh, dressing room hoping to catch a word of what he would said. And uh, one reporter finally got close enough to ask him a question and they said, Sir, why did you give so many encore performances? You could have stopped after the first one and everyone would have been so impressed And everyone would have been so amazed at your skill and your ability to play a violin. He stopped and he said uh, very carefully, for the very first time in my career, he says, my master, the one who taught me to play this very violin, was in the audience. He went on to say that during his first performance, everyone stood up except for that master that taught him to play that violin. The second encore, or the first encore, Still, everybody was up except that man. Third one, still wasn't up. Finally, after that fourth one, he looked out into the seats and saw that everyone was standing, including his master. It was only then that he was satisfied that he had done a good job. Who are we living to please today? Is our life living in such a way, being lived in such a way, excuse me, on receiving the praises of men, or are we striving to please the master? Hebrews 2.12 tells us to look into our faith, look into the finisher, look into Jesus, excuse me, the author and finisher of our faith, so that our focus may be kept on Christ, that we may be satisfied we did a good job. When we hear those words like the Apostle Paul looked forward to hearing, 
Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We see in our text today, John is a man in a similar circumstance. John is getting praise from a lot of people. John is having people come to him and and people are asking uh, this man questions. And what he simply does is he takes these questions and he points the, the answer to his questions and he points the idea of these questions all the way back to Jesus Christ. And we need to do the same thing today. We could be praised for how we're living. We could be praised for coming out of, out of an addiction. Or we can be praised at, at how well we're doing in this life. And we need to remember that when we get praise like that, that there is a true place of praise that we need to be where that praise is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come together here on, on Sundays and on Wednesdays, this needs to be a place of praise. It should not be the only place of praise, but it should be a place of praise where God's getting praise. So we're going to see three things about the place of praise, what those three things are that we need to have. We see, first of all, number one this morning, we see that the place of praise has leaders. Number one, the place of praise has leaders. Look with me, if you would, back at verse 22 there in John chapter 3. After these things came Jesus and His disciples into the land of Judea, and there He tarried with them. That just means that He stayed there He wasn't thinking about going anywhere. It did not look like he was going anywhere. He looked like he was staying there. And they weren't sure how long he was going to be there. He tarried there with them and baptized. And John was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. There is someone that stands out in a place of praise. Whenever you're at this place of praise, there is somebody that stands out. There is a leader there because we see that a place of praise has leaders. This person, even though they're a leader, they're not a glory hog. They're not desiring the preeminence. They are committed to making much of God. They are standing up and they are pointing the way. They are lighting the way. They're doing everything they can to show who truly deserves praise. Excuse me. They are doing everything they can to show who truly but deserves praise and where that praise belongs to. Even if they're getting praise, they are taking that praise and pointing it squarely where it belongs on the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that this leader of praise is somebody who starts by being a leader of truth. For there to be proper praise to God, there must be truth. We can't just get up and say, praise God, praise God, praise God. There's got to be some truth there. There has to be something that gives us reason to praise. If there isn't truth in your praise, what do you have? If there isn't right doctrine to stand on, what will you stand on? John chapter 4 verses 23 through 24 tells us, But the hour cometh. And now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. That phrase is repeated there several times. Because there's the idea there that you can worship Him in spirit. And, and, and everything inside of you is, 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 is just wanting to worship and wanting to get it out. But where's your truth got to be? On the flip side, you can have truth, and what are we doing with it? We can have truth and not be worshiping with our heart. You may say, how do you worship with your heart? What, what you put into your mind gets into your heart. It starts with right here. The brain is such a complex organ I don't have time to go into it, but I just know this this morning, friends. If I think about something for a long time, boy, it gets inside of my heart and it becomes an action. Boy, that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. What I focus on, what I give my time to, what I give my talents to, what I give my treasures to can get inside of me. And it does, like I said, it's, it's amazing, but it's scary. The things we focus on, how it can come out in our lives just naturally. But there has to be truth there. Because we can all be about all the Spirit. And boy, we want to get everybody excited. Where's the truth at? I know people that can, that can really whoop it up on a Sunday morning. And boy, you feel like a million bucks. But what do you have the rest of the week to take with you? On the flip side, I know some people that have truth. And they can probably uh, preach and, and, and teach better than I. But there's no spirit there. There's no spirit of love. There's not as what's the fruit of the spirit? We just read about it. We read a verse earlier out of Galatians five. 
love, joy. Uh, that was where it just stopped at that verse, but there's a whole more that just build from there. But I know people that have a doctrinal statement, boy, I agree with it, but I don't want anything to do with them. Because to be quite honest, they're rude, they have the personality of an art mark. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't go around and be that way. It's not a spiritual gift to be a jerk. Do you know that when you, look, when you read through spiritual gifts in the Bible, being a jerk isn't one of them. And I'm not saying be firm. Or I'm not saying you can't be firm and you have to be soft and loosey-goosey. No, you can be firm and not be a jerk. <coughs> Excuse me. Mark chapter 6, 18 through 20. For John said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him. This is the same John we're talking about. And would have him killed. Uh, uh, would have had him killed. But she would not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man, a holy, observed him. And when he had heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. A man that was being rebuked by John. We don't want people getting in our business, do we? We don't want anybody telling us, you got something to work on. At least my dad used to tell me that. you got something to work on. I hated that. I hated it because he was right. That's probably why I hated it. None of us like to be told we have something to work on. John's telling this guy, Herod, you've got something to work on. But he still received it. Now his wife didn't like it, but he received it. John had a continuance in his work and continuance in the truth as long as his opportunities lasted because he knew his time was short. We're like John here. Now our head's not going to be put on a platter, most likely. But friends, your time's short and my time's short. The book of James says that your life is but a vapor. I look back at just my own life. I can remember 20 years ago like it was yesterday. And if I sit long enough to think about how did I get here? 20 years just fly by. We see that this person is not only a leader of truth, but they are also a leader of reconciliation. Both John and Jesus preached a message of reconciliation. There was This was the point a lost generation to their only hope, which was Jesus Christ. We have a generation today that their only hope is Jesus Christ. You can't trust in the economy. Right? I don't think everybody's happy about the economy. You can't trust in government. You still need to exercise your right to vote, of course, but you can't trust in government. It's got to be Christ. We can make all sorts of laws to tell people what they ought to do, but in reality, if you want to see change, it doesn't come from Congress, and it doesn't come from the Supreme Court. It comes through Jesus Christ living in us and changing how we think and changing how we live. You want to get rid of abortion? You want to get rid of something like that? I think we all agree it's disgusting. It shouldn't be allowed. Get rid of abortion is going to, to, is going to take more than just writing a bunch of laws. Someone has got to have a reason to not want to abort a baby. That's only going to come through Jesus. It's not going to come through, well, we've passed a bunch of laws. I'm not against that. But what I want to say is, even though you pass a bunch of laws, we, we see, all saw this happen during Prohibition in the 20s. People find a way around laws. Kids at school find ways around the rules at school. And I know it because I did it when I was in school. We had a rule at church that you weren't supposed to act a certain way when I was a kid. I'm going to tell on myself here just so that it kind of puts people at ease. We had this big step. And me and the other kids would play King of the Mountain on this step. Somebody get up, you just push all the other kids off. Basically, you're playing King of the Mountain. Not a good game to be playing in church. But I was eight or nine, so my dad didn't know. And I, I told him about two or three years ago, so the statutes of limitation had passed on my discipline. <laughs> but uh, we would do that. And no matter how many times, we always had adults come over and tell us not to do that. We found a way to still play it anyhow. And I remember telling my dad, if I would known that, I would have blistered your rear end. Yeah, you probably would have. People can find a way around rules. It takes, it takes being reconciled to a holy God to have there, for there to be life change. Matthew 3, 8 through 9 says, Bring therefore fruits, meat for your repentance. <coughs> Excuse me, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to raise... Uh, is able these sons to raise up children unto Abraham. Matthew introduces uh, John the Baptist as a fulfillment of Isaiah 40, verse 3. And the, the verse I read in Matthew is talking about reconciliation. 
It's not about your lineage. It's not about Abraham. It's Jesus is our only hope for that. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We, we're, we're, we could be a voice in the wilderness now. Not because there's some sort of um, special revelation you're given, but because we have God's Word. And, and God desires that people be reconciled to Him through Jesus Christ so we can be that voice in the wilderness. John the Baptist announced a special office of Jesus as a Redeemer of men. <coughs> Excuse me, But thus He prepared the way for a gospel which based on its invitations of peace on the doctrine of sacrifice. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, John says, but uh, he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. J.C. Ryle said this, said that every faithful minister must be content to be less thought of by his believing hearers in proportion as they grow in the knowledge and faith and seek Christ Himself more clearly. In other words, the more of Jesus you see, the less of the minister you should see. Just as John said in our last verse in verse 30, when he says, I must decrease so that He must increase. He must increase, but I must decrease. How horrible would it say, how horrible would it be, excuse me, if someone were to come here and say, I came here looking for Jesus, but Joshua Wayne Hall got in the way. There is only one high priest and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Any so-called minister who declares himself an authority over a church is a liar and a deceiver. Secondly, we see not only does the place of praise have leaders, leaders that point people to Christ, leaders that lead in truth and lead to, with reconciliation, but a place of praise has peacemakers. Peacemakers, look at verses 25 and 26. There arose a question between some of John's disciples about, and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he uh, that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same uh, baptizeth, and all men come to him. We see here the, the opportunity here for John to be a peacemaker with this question. The disciples of John sound a little bit jealous here. They got caught up in the subject of purifying. It was important to the Jews. Under the Old Testament law, they had to keep themselves ceremoniously clean if they wanted to serve God and please Him. As always, the Pharisees added extra things. They made it an extra burden to come to God. This burden caused them to focus on a self-righteous system and not God. They got so caught up with what they could do. They weren't caught up with what Jesus did. Listen, friends, when you get caught up with what Jesus did, it is going to motivate you to serve and live a certain way. It's not about, well, we're doing this to make the preacher happy, or I'm doing this to make my wife happy, or my husband. No, friends, when when you when you get saved and you don't get over it, you get motivated to serve and live a certain way. It's a dangerous thing to get over salvation. And I can tell you that because I've done it. It's easy to do. I've been that one that says, well, I'm saved. Now what? And I just would sit on the sideline and didn't want to be involved. These peacemakers, they have perspectives and problems as they are being a leader in a place of praise. They're being a peacemaker by having perspectives and problems. John's disciples had a big, huge hang-up that so many people were going to Jesus and submitting to Him for baptism. They even exaggerated it and described it as all. You ever know anybody does that? Everybody's doing this! Everybody's doing that! Is everybody really doing that? You ever heard a kid come home from school? Everybody's doing it, Mom! Is everybody really doing it? Would you go there and really see all 400 students doing what you're saying everybody's doing? Right? John's reply suggests that he sensed their jealousy of Jesus' popularity. They had failed to grasp John's purpose for his ministry. His purpose was to prepare the way. His purpose was to be a voice in the wilderness. It wasn't to heap a bunch of groupies, as I call it, unto himself. You know what groupies are? 
Those are people that just kind of follow a, follow a band around, right? He's not trying to build that. He's trying to prepare the way for the kingdom. He's trying to prepare a way for people to be reconciled. That's what we should be doing. As much as we want this place full, and man, it's encouraging to see this place with the numbers we're running. It's it, more important than numbers. It's about preparing the way. It's about this being a place of praise and a place where we're pointing people to Jesus Christ. Not pointing people to Josh Hall. That's the last place you need to be pointing people to. Because I'm going to fail. Some of you are saying, yeah, we've, you've been here for what, four, almost five months now and we've seen you fail. So thirdly and lastly this morning, we see that a place of praise has leaders, people that give some direction, people that are peacemakers, that have perspective on the issue. That's something that sometimes is lacking in a group. That's what's sometimes lacking in a place that should be praised, a lack of perspective. Because sometimes churches, if, and it can happen anywhere, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but instead of being a place for hurting people to come and be reconciled to God, a church can just become a country club or mausoleum for saints. Thirdly, we see that a place of praise has joyful cheer. Joyful cheer. Look at verse 27 through 30 and we're almost done. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am him uh, sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. With his with joy, excuse me, in his heart, John was fulfilling his role as that voice in the desert. His role was that of what we call today the best man at a wedding. It's basically how he's describing himself. He is the best man at a wedding, that union of two people coming together. Weddings were a big deal back in these times. A wedding would last a week. Can you imagine that? It's stressful enough planning a wedding for... Not even a day for just a few hours. Can you imagine planning a wedding that goes a week? If you're a guest to that wedding, boy, you're going to get fed. You don't have to worry about groceries, right? They would have been planned months in advance. It was the bridegroom who was responsible for getting his house ready. Then the wedding would take place when the house was ready and everything was prepared the bridegroom had a best man who was many times his closest friend who would do all the work, take care of certain duties and communicate with the bride, letting the bride know when and where and how to meet as everything was coming together. Finally, when that day was come, it was supposed to happen that he would take the bride, the best man would take the bride and take her to the bridegroom. And that's, similar, that's a picture here of John's role. Of, of being that one that would take people to Jesus. And today, God wants us to take people to Jesus. doesn't mean that you save them, but you prepare the way. You share your testimony. You, you, give, you give the Scripture that says that we must be saved. We see here joy in preparation. It was a joy for John to prepare everything. It wasn't burdensome, but there was joy in his preparation. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says, Every good, every gift, every good gift, excuse me, and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God sees this as a beautiful thing. 1 Thessalonians 4 16 through 18 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise for first, and we which are alive shall be caught up together uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This should be a comfort when there's that day when we're united with Christ. Right now we're waiting. We're waiting. We know we've got that gift coming. James talks about every good and perfect gift, and it starts with salvation. We don't recognize good and perfect gifts until we first recognize that gift of salvation that we need. 
And Jesus himself talks about what, he, what he's going to do to prepare. In John 14, too, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. He's using this imagery to describe that he is up there making intercession right now. We know if you read the book of Hebrews, and for sake of time, we're not going to turn there. But we know he's making intercession. Have you ever went to court and you have an attorney that argues for you? I'm sure you're, if, if you had a good outcome, you're sure glad you had a good attorney, didn't, aren't you? Guess what? When it comes to God, we've got the best attorney, Jesus Christ, who is arguing and pleading. But you can't, you can't have Him arguing or pleading for you until you've called upon Him for salvation. You can't have Him because you're not part of God's family. He's not part of your team unless you've confessed that you're a sinner and you believe and you call on Him for salvation as Romans 10 says. There's joy not just in preparation, but joy in presentation that John talks about here. There is joy in presenting praise. There's joy in presenting Jesus. It's a joyful time when the bride and the groom are together. John's joy was to hear the voice of the bridegroom and know that he had claimed his bride. Do we hear the voice of Jesus today? We do through his word. For some of us in here, the people you're around, you might be the only Bible somebody sees. So just like the bride wanted to hear what the bridegroom had to say through the best man, we've got God's Word. We have a similar role to tell people about Jesus. We have a similar role to prepare the way. There was joy in presentation. How do we present Christ? Hosea 2, verse 19. And uh, when you think about the book of Hosea, Hosea describes Israel as a spouse that is unfaithful to another spouse. And the heart that God still has in that situation to see reconciliation. Listen carefully to Hosea 2, 19. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. He loves you. He loves you enough to chase after you today. He might be chasing after you just through this message. Because friends, there's no such things as accidents, only appointments. While there's a time when we will be reunited with Jesus, we can experience life with Him right now. The eternal life that Jesus offers, it's not meant just to have your ticket punched for heaven one day when you go home to glory. It's meant to make a difference in your life today. It's meant to take whatever it is in your life that you think is shambles. God wants to take that and make something beautiful out of it. God wants to take that and use that to further the kingdom of God. God wants to take that, friends, and see that be used for His glory and His honor. Don't think about your mistakes. Don't think about your shortcomings. That's what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants you to go back in time in your mind, not, not in a DeLorean, but in your mind, He wants you to go back in time and He wants to remind you of every failure. You ever known people like that, that every time you make a mistake, it feels like they're, they're there with a checkboard just recording it? That's what Satan does. Satan does that. And by the way, if you've got somebody in your life that just records every, every fault and every shortcoming, probably not the best person for you to be around. In closing... John Wesley was about 21 years old when he went to Oxford University. He came from a Christian home. He was smart. He was very intelligent. He had some good looks. He had a lot of skills. Yet in those days, he was a bit snobbish and sarcastic. One night, however, something happened that set in motion a change in John Wesley's heart. While speaking with a porter, that's somebody who is a worker, He speaks to this worker and he discovered that this poor fellow only had one coat and lived in very impoverished conditions. He didn't even have a bed to sleep on. Yet he was a happy person, even though this man didn't have very much. And John Wesley took notice of that. Wesley, being immature and kind of arrogant, joked about the man's misfortunes and said, What else do you thank God for? since you don't really have a whole lot. And with a touch of sarcasm, 
the worker smiled and in the spirit of meekness replied with joy, I thank him that he has given me my life and being and a heart to love him and above all a consistent desire to serve him. Deeply moved, Wesley recognized that this man knew the meaning of true thankfulness. Many years later in 1791, John Wesley laid on his deathbed at age 88 by then. There were several gathered around him and they soon realized he had learned the lesson of praising God in every circumstance. Despite Wesley's extreme weakness, he began singing the hymn, I'll praise my Maker while I've got breath. We need to be thankful this morning, not just because it's November, but because for us to grow, for us to have joy in our life, it it starts with being thankful and being grateful. If we're not thankful for the little things God has given us, the book of James, uh, as I read earlier, said that every good and perfect gift comes from above. If we don't thank God for the little things we have now, why would we recognize something grand and big later? If we don't thank God for the small blessings we have today, we're not going to recognize the big things God wants to do in our lives and in our church. Be thankful this morning. If you wonder, boy, how, how do I create a place of praise? How do I create a place of praise in my home, when I'm in the car, when I'm by myself? Find something to be thankful for. Find something to be thankful for. John Wesley had to be humbled a little bit to learn that. And God has a way of humbling us. But if you're thankful today, if you find things to be thankful for, you'll, you'll notice a change. You'll notice a change around you. And you might even notice a change in the people around you. Because our homes and our church, they need to be places of praise. And that doesn't just happen because, well, God, I hope it's a place of praise. We've, we've, we've got to be thankful. We've got to be looking for how God's working today to have a place of praise. We need people that are leaders. We need people that are peacemakers. We need people to have that kind of perspective. And then for a place of praise to go on, we need to be joyful. You don't have to be the best singer. I know people that are good singers and they ain't joyful. God loves a joyful giver, the Bible tells us. I think we could also say there in that situation, God wants to hear a joyful noise as well. Let's pray.